Hey, good morning. So glad you guys are here. If we haven't met before, my name is Josh, just like Eric said. It's Josh. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and I find great joy in getting to share what God is up to and share from his word with you guys. Uh, I get to work with our groups ministry, with our adult ministry, get to work with our marriage ministry. As Eric was saying, uh, that date night is coming up, and it's going to be awesome. Uh, we've been joking all week about how do you market something to people who are married, engaged, and seriously dating? Because married is pretty self-explanatory, and engaged, that's pretty easy to communicate as well, but seriously dating is kind of tricky, and some of you guys are seriously dating and you don't even know it, uh, or some of you guys think you are, but you're not. So I want to encourage you guys, if you, if you think you are or you think you aren't, come to the date night. And by the end of the night, you're going to know, okay, we're seriously dating. Um, or you're going to know, like, all right, it's time to cut and run. <laughs> Thanks for the dessert. Um, but it's going to be such a fun night. It's going to be sweet and enriching. Uh, I really think that's going to be a fun way for a lot of people here to connect. Uh, happy Groundhog Day as well. It's a big holiday for people in the north. Um, but spring is coming early, apparently. It's starting in like two hours. It's going to be 77 <laughs> today. Um, and it's going to last all the way until Wednesday when it's snowing. So get excited <laughs> about that. If you're watching online, I want to greet our online viewers. We're so glad that you decided to join us. However you found this feed, we're pumped that you found us. And we'd love for you to join us here in person. It's a different vibe. We've got coffee, all sorts of fun things going on. But we understand this is a great way to connect. Uh, feel free to engage in the comment section. We have people there who are thumbing along, answering your questions and interacting. We'd love to connect with you there. You've joined us in our fifth week of our series we're calling Out of Water, where we're rethinking the thinking that defeats you. And sometimes you have to take a fish out of the water for the fish to recognize how important the water is. And it's when you're removed from your element, when you're away from your understanding, that you begin to take a step toward better understanding what you don't understand. And so we've journeyed through four big things that affect us. I'll give you a quick flyover. Uh, conquering fear was our first rethinking moment. And then with that, defeating worry was week two. And if you want to know the difference between fear and worry, I want to encourage you to go online. We keep our sermons on uh, on YouTube, we keep them on the podcast, on our Spring Creek app. You can find our sermons there. They're really great ways to break down and re-remember what you've heard before. It's conquering fear, defeating worry, getting unstuck from the rhythms and the patterns that you're in, and then stopping blame was last week's message. And when you look at these things, fear, worry, stuck, blame, all those things kind of accumulate into today's discussion on reacting versus responding. Reactivity is one of our greatest weaknesses, and we label it as so many other things, but I think we can give ourselves an umbrella term and call it reactivity, and reacting is, is kind of just part of who we are. It's natural. You don't have to think to do it. If there's something flying towards your eye, your eyelid automatically closes, or your head moves out of the way if you have time to think about it. We react naturally, but... For the most part, a lot of our reactions are negative. A lot of our reactions are things that we wish we wouldn't have said, wish we wouldn't have done, wish we wouldn't have texted or tweeted or Facebooked or Instagrammed, but they're out there. And so we keep, if you picked up one of these on the way in, uh, we keep our message notes on here, which is a great way to take notes, to reiterate what we're talking about, or to see how close we are to the end of the message. If you're debating, like, should I go, should I go, should I go? It'll help you follow along. So that, that kind of makes it easier to remember, but I wanted to make it even more easy to remember, so I've got two big rhyming points today. And the first one is reaction is when your worst comes out first. Our reactions to things are when our worst presents itself first. And then we take a step back and we're like, oh, I did not mean to say it like that. I am so sorry. I, I still meant what I said. I didn't mean to say it like that. And we can be honest with each other. Our reactions are knee-jerk. It's that test that the doctor does when you're sitting on the table and he hits you with a hammer and your foot swings out. That's a, a muscular response. You're supposed to do that. You hit it, your foot goes out. If not, there's something wrong. So naturally, we react. We're quick. Without thinking, we say. Without quick thinking, we do. Our reactions are difficult. So I want to do a quick, like, 
crowdsourcing poll, but instead of raising your hand, I, I want you to just kind of agree or disagree, because I don't want your neighbor to judge you accidentally, which would be a reaction if you think about it. <laughs> so just feel to like nod if you agree that maybe your worst comes out first when you're behind the wheel of an automobile. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty accurate. I want you to know that I am the chief of sinners when it comes to this. And it's, it's really just because deep down I think I'm better than you at driving. I've got a whole thesis, a whole stand-up routine. I'm prepared to battle anyone in dialogue on driving an automobile. But in, in Dallas County alone, I mean, Dallas drivers are known throughout the country as a special breed of people. <laughs> and you, you either love them or you dislike them. And if you dislike them, I want to encourage you to go north of the Red River or west of Amarillo, and you'll encounter different people who move at a different speed in a 70 mile an hour zone. But that's when my worst comes out first is when I'm behind the wheel of an automobile. Maybe your worst comes out first when you're grocery shopping and everybody else is grocery shopping. And you just have to get one thing on this one aisle but Karen and Susan are having a conversation blocking both sides of the aisle, <laughs> talking about Girl Scout cookies coming up. And they're not picking up on your subtle hints of inching forward and looking past them longingly at the chunky soup. <laughs> and you have a reaction. Or you decide, I'm going to go around the other way, only to find they've moved down to block the soup on the other aisle. This might be a big one. Your worst may come out first when it comes to interacting with children, your own or others. For me personally, I have a four-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. And I just love them to death so much. But sometimes I forget that. <laughs> and you've been there with me. And sometimes they've got things they need and want while I'm also driving. So it's a twofer. And my reaction comes out like it shouldn't. And so I, I'm not saying these things to brag about how bad I am, but I am saying these things to say I, I need to work on this, and we can work on this together. And I don't think we get to a point of nirvana when it comes to reaction or responding, but I think we can mature along this process. There, there's two things that I like to think about when we react, and one of them is a tea kettle. A tea kettle you know, sits on the stove empty or wherever you store it, but something happens when you fill it with water. It, it could just sit there with water for a long time. Some of you guys right now at this moment have tea kettles with water in it, and you don't know how long the water's been sitting in it. But then something happens when you turn the stove on, and you count to 100, and the water in there starts to move around a little bit, and pressure starts to build. And then eventually, when the pressure cannot handle the space it's confined in, it, it shoots out in smoke and whistling to let you know something's going on inside that you could not see. Or maybe a volcano is a better way to think about it. It's a mountain, and inside there's a bunch of movement and a lot of science happening. I'm, just, I'm not a scientist, so I'll speak generally. But over time, that pressure builds up and builds up, builds up, and then it erupts ash and lava all over the place. And when it comes to reaction, our worst comes out first. We are tea kettles. We are volcanoes. We're the volcano that erupted. And, and then we're like, oh, oh, can we scoop the lava back in to the volcano? Because I didn't mean it like that. But now you guys think I'm the grumpy guy or the angry dad or the mean driver or whatever it is. And so we're trying to scoop this lava back up into the volcano and it doesn't work like that. Reactions are volatile. Reactions are dangerous. Reactions are what we're most known for most of the time. It's kind of sad if you think we're known for something when our worst comes out first. We've got to rethink how we're thinking when it comes to this. And so there's two tests I want to give you if you want to see if you're in a good place. And the first one is the stubbing your toe test. Stubbing your toe is no joke. On whatever. But the way you respond when you stub your toe reveals something that's happening inside of you. 
It may be mindless. You just blurt out a word. Maybe a word you haven't heard since you were in the Navy. You just blurt it out. But if you stub your toe and you haven't eaten in a long time, you've got that boiling up inside of you, and now you're upset about the toe, but also you're still hungry, and your body's processing two different emotions the same way. If you stub your toe and you haven't slept much, your body's going to respond to your toe, but also to the fact that everything else in life is irritable right now. And maybe your body's telling you something. It also tells you how much are you aware of the people around you. Because maybe you stub your toe and you're in front of your children. Or if you want to see something cool, watch like a kindergartner teacher stub her toe in front of the children. And you get to see like, a golly gee, that kind of hurts. <laughs> if there's the self-awareness that I've got all these innocent ears around me. But if that kindergarten teacher has been not eating very much or haven't slept a whole lot and he or she stubs their toe and lets something slip and then you've got 20 kindergartners going home to their parents asking what this word means or using it the next time they drop their sippy cup your reaction has a reaction has a reaction we've got these ripples this chain link reaction effect in our lives and the newest test i've been put through is called the why why, why, why test. <laughs> and that's the word why, not the letter. And it's because I have a four-year-old daughter. And she is so curious and so sweet. But all I hear is she's unwilling to hear my first answer and be satisfied with that. And that, that drives the churning in the volcano to where you lose sight of the person you're with and you focus on the inconvenience of being with them. And that's convicting as a father. That's convicting as a husband. That's convicting as an employer. That's convicting as a neighbor. When you're in the Chick-fil-A line, why do you have to give them money? Well, because the, I'm, they're going to give us chicken, and it's not free. Why'd you pay at this window? Where's the chicken? We get the chicken at the next window. Why? Well, because they do the money at this window. Why? Because money's dirty and chicken's clean. <laughs> Why? Because a lot of people touch money. Why? Because they give it and there's change involved. And Why? Well, that's how money works. <laughs> and then you're lunging forward 40 feet to the next window with someone just taking great pleasure in serving you your chicken. Why did I only get two sauces? Because that's all they had. Why? They ran out. And I think, oh, she's doing this to poke the bear, when really she's just curious. She's four. She doesn't know the answer to all these questions. And I lose sight on the fact that I'm with a person who God loves as much as me, probably more than me. And I choose to focus on the inconvenience rather than the person. Because the reaction is when your worst comes out first. And when your patience gets tested. And when your hunger is revealed. When your fear, imperfection, shame pride boils up inside of you, you get to see a reaction. A quick caveat, we, we see good reactions. There are good things that happen when you mix two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen and we get water. See, maybe I am a scientist. <laughs> or when you mix the Na and the Cl and you put it on a steak, you get salt. There's good reactions. When you see something about to fall and you catch it, there's good reactions. But then they also lead us to the next reaction. Yesterday I was pouring my daughter a, a healthy breakfast called Lucky Charms <laughs> with almond milk. And so it's healthy. And I'm taking it to her from the counter to the table. And as I turn, I see my son is walking backwards on a chair. And so... I lunge to set the Lucky Charms down, and I catch my son, save his life, father of the year, reeling about how great of a father I am, only to turn and see my four-year-old has milk on her dress, and her Lucky Charms have spilled. You spilled my milk. My Lucky Charms fell out while I was catching your brother. I wanted my Lucky Charms. And she doesn't like getting dirty, because she's four-year-old, and it's a great dress. 
So then I'm re reacting to her as I was reacting to her brother. Like, did you not see how cool that was? I caught him. I snatched him up. So I scoop it all back up into the bowl. And I don't want milk on my Lucky Charms. And then I'm reacting some more. And so I, I hope I've spelled this out, that, that many of us have these reactions multiple times an hour, and we don't even realize how often we're reacting from our anger, discomfort, frustration, fear, worry, shame, pride, doubt. Today we live in a culture where you can react more and be seen by more than ever before thanks to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Reddit and wherever else you engage with people, group chats, Slack, group emails. But a lot of times we send something out there and we think, whew, 10 minutes down the road you realize you shouldn't have posted that, you shouldn't have sent that. Or you, you see someone else posted something that's from the, the differing political bent. And not only are you going to post about how you disagree with that on that post, but you're going to help them realize how maybe they're not intelligent, which then makes you feel more intelligent, which then makes you look like a J-E-R-K right there on social media. We're reacting with our thumbs, we're reacting with our words, we're reacting with our actions. And we see this throughout our culture, but we also see this throughout the scripture. And I think scripture points us to a lot of interactions where Jesus could have easily reacted to people and snapped his fingers and just pillar of salt, all of them, gotten rid of them. Just, all right, God, hey, it's Jesus. Let's do the Noah thing again, because these people don't get it. But I wanted to focus on one little thing. We're about 10 weeks away from Easter, and so we, I want to pick up in a story where Jesus was focusing on the fact that his death was coming up. And he's, he's teaching, as we read through Luke chapter 9, he's teaching and he's performing miracles and he's telling people big things. And he said, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Like That's what it looks, because if anyone wants to lose his life, then he's willing to save it. And anyone who loses his life for me does save his life. And he says, i got to go to Jerusalem. That's where it's all going to end. That's where I need to go. That's where I need to interact. So we're going to pick up in verse 51 of chapter 9. It said, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. So maybe a little bit of an overreaction from James and John. They went on ahead, prepared this space. He gets to a Samaritan village, him and a bunch of Jews, and the Jews and the Samaritans don't get along at all, and so I don't know why they would expect the Samaritans to treat them hospitably with hospitality, but they get there, and they're like, you're not going to stay here. Keep on going. We know you're going to Jerusalem. We know you're Jews. This isn't going to work. The funny thing is, is 50 verses in chapter 9 before this, Jesus is telling them about how they're going to go places where people don't want them there. They're going to interact with people who don't want to interact with them, and he tells them how to behave. He says in chapter 9, verse 5, wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, Shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So we've got this fire versus dust. If you get somewhere and they don't want you there, then leave. Shake off the dust on your sandals. Kick off your feet and go on with your day. Shaking off of the dust disassociates with you with them. It's like, okay, I'm not welcome here. I'm leaving your dust here. But James and John forgot that 50 verses later. We're like, Jesus, they don't want us here. How about we call down fire from heaven and destroy them? That'll show them. And Jesus responds like probably a good father should. He says, no, let's just move on. Instead of being hot-headed, he was cool and collected. There's these reactions that boil up for different reasons. And you have to think James and John were defending Jesus. They were standing for the cause. They were sent and they were going to prepare for Jesus and they were going to lead Jesus to Jerusalem with these people. And now there was a change of plans. 
And I think that's where we see that reactions come from anger, but anger is a secondary emotion to whatever else we're actually dealing with. So you have to think, why were the disciples angry? Like, what were they angry about? Fear? Like, oh no, we, we were supposed to prepare a place for Jesus, and now that he's here, he can't be here. I've let him down. Differing perspectives. The Jews believe one thing, the Samaritans believe another thing. The Jews behave a certain way, the Samaritans behave a different way. And so James and John realize that these people believe different than us, so my best response to that is to send fire down from heaven to destroy them. And I wonder if maybe we relate to that as we interact with people who believe different things than us, who behave differently than us, who post different things than the truth we believe. Yet we, we've been sent to defend, so we're going to stand up. And God, I know you're not going to send fire down on them, but I'm just going to send fire from my fingertips as I type my response, and they're going to know that I'm a messenger of the Lord. Come to defend you on Facebook. God does not need you to defend him on Facebook. He needs you to represent him on Facebook. And sometimes after we're done typing all that stuff, Instead of clicking the post button, we should probably just tap, select all, and then click the backspace button, and then move on with our day. We'll feel good, we got it off our chest, but no one had to see that we were kind of making a fool of ourselves. Maybe that's a better representation of Jesus on Facebook. Maybe the disciples were ashamed. Like, we're with, we're with Jesus, and he's already been shut down, he's already been blocked out. I'm ashamed that I, I wasn't able to perform to the standard that he needed. I wasn't able to do the thing that he asked me to do. Maybe they're tired. We just walked all this way and you don't have space for us? We can't stay here? And then they get defensive. And we have all these moments of reaction in our life and I think when we think of our anger, we should rethink of our anger as what's below the surface. Am I angry because I'm tired, hungry, or am I angry because I'm proud? And maybe I shouldn't be as proud as I am. I shouldn't think of myself as highly as I should. Just as Eric was reading in our time of musical worship from Philippians 2. Paul says that you should not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But instead consider others as more important than yourself. And that's what happens when there's unity in Christ. That's what happens when there's comfort and love. That's what makes his joy complete. Is when we're willing to back away from the keyboard catch our breath before we speak, to be calm, cool, and collected. I think there's, there's a ton of wisdom that we have to choose from in Scripture when it looks at how we behave versus what we really mean. And a lot of our reactions are warranted and justified, but they don't always get heard because of the way we present them. And so King Solomon has a verse for us in Proverbs chapter 18, verses 12 and 13. He says, before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and his shame. This is all about the way we react, the way that we're behaving and interacting, because our reactions are rarely hidden. But destruction is going to come when we begin to see of ourselves haughty, more highly than we ought to. When we see with pride, when we think we're right, whether you're right or not, when we think we're right, we know we're right, we treat others as they're wrong, destruction is sure to follow. If we respond before we listen, then we experience folly and shame. But humility comes before honor. This, this honor that we think we deserve beyond our fear, shame, frustration. Within our pride, we think, okay, I'm an honorable person, so I need to stand up for this cause. I need to post this thing. I need to do this. And we don't do that in love. We're not listening. We're just posting. We're just saying. We're just doing. We're just reacting. And it's not creating honor, but it's creating destruction. And it's giving us folly and shame. So when we think of reaction as putting our worst first, I think the other way to think about it is response is when you know quick, slow, slow. And quick, slow, slow is the formula we get 
for righteous responding, whether we're angry or not, righteous responding. And it comes from James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, give us everything we need to chew on, to focus on, to do in order to respond better. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Quick, slow, slow. When you know that and you repeat that and that's your mantra in your life as you become a less reactive person, you're able to produce the righteousness of God. But that's difficult. Quick to listen? That's countercultural, counterintuitive. Because as you were talking, I already figured out what I was going to say. So why would I need to listen more? Why does there need to be a pause between the, the last word in your sentence and the first word in my sentence? Especially the more heated this debate gets. The more right I become and the more wrong you reveal yourself to be. I need to pause, be quick to listen. And listen means like, all right, listen to all of it. Not, okay, I heard from the first sentence kind of the gist of what you're going to say, so I'm just going to throw this one back at you. Listening first gives us time to process. If you're like me and you live with your foot in your mouth half the time, it's good to just leave the foot there so you have time to think without speaking rather than speak without thinking. And if we're quick to listen, if we live our lives seeking out times to listen instead of speak, then we can pursue the righteousness of God. Listening gives our minds time to catch up with our mouths. And I'm not going to overgeneralize, but men, we're pretty good at speaking before thinking. And it's not because we're not intelligent or charming or witty or smart, whatever it is. We just happen to, to speak. Our mouth muscle is just more trained than our brain muscle. So let's be quick to listen. Slow to speak. I think speak is, is not just verbal, but it deals with your nonverbals and your, your typeface. Slow to speak, slow to type, slow to post, slow to tweet, slow to accelerate, slow to lay on the horn, slow to jerk into someone else's lane. Slow. Slow means that we have that time to gather. We have that time to Really consider, what did I just hear? What did I just experience? Slow to judge. Most of our reactions come from snap judgments of people, and we've defined the entire person in a box just by one post they've made, one thing they've done, one silly thing they've said. But if we're slow to speak, we're also slow to judge. And then slow to become angry. I think this is great that James put this one last. Because... If we're quick to listen and slow to speak, then naturally our anger will slow as well. Because in those times of listening, of processing, we may reveal, I have so much I want to say to this right now, but I probably need to have a Snickers first. And that's going to give me time to chew, process, and think, and then I can respond. And oftentimes that, that time that it takes to finish a Snickers gives you enough time to think. And some of you are just chewing it quickly because you're ready to respond, but then all the nougat is still in your teeth, and you have, you're forced to respond slowly. We need those accountabilities in our life. Slow to become angry means that I'm willing to see what's below the surface. What am I really wrestling with? What am I really wanting to respond with? Maybe I'm not hungry. Maybe I'm tired. Maybe I'm not tired. Maybe I've been hurt by this person before in the past, and I'm holding on to that as they talk about this one thing. Maybe I think they're uneducated, uninformed. Maybe I think I'm better than them. Maybe I think I'm right and they're wrong. Maybe I'm, I'm holding this thing against them because they happen to drive the same car as someone else that drives me crazy. It's kind of a ridiculous thought, but if you've had an encounter with a blue Toyota on the highway and you see that same blue Toyota parked at Panera Bread or wherever, you're gonna think they're related. But when we're slow to become angry, we're processing those deeper emotions. What am I afraid of? What am I frustrated by? 
Why do I care too much about this? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. So I, I spelled out this process at the end of your notes. This is how you know we're getting close to the end. Remember from earlier? A lot of you guys are like, oh, okay. If you're holding it, we're almost done. But this process for overcoming reactivity applies to your marriage, your friendships, your parenting, your work, your community, your neighbors, your digital communities, your social circles, whether present or digital. If we were to apply this process and realize that it really can produce the righteousness of God, I think Christians might begin to get a better rap. Even in election year, if we were to do these things, it could speak pretty loudly to people that maybe Christians are all about love and not just judgmental hypocrites. That Christians are all about Jesus and not just about accumulating our wealth and status. Because that's what people think of us. So the first thing we can do is stop. Because our first gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction, want to, is to go. You said this, I'm going to say this. You did this, I'm going to do that. But if we were to stop, then we might have a second to take a deep breath. To actually finish listening to what's being said or watching what's being done. Or not just hearing what they're saying, but hearing how they're saying it. So stop. And then invite. We can invite God into our responsive process. And a lot of us know that right now as we're not reacting to things, but we're going to forget that, that you can invite God. James goes on in chapter 3 to talk about how our tongue is powerful and it could start a blaze in a forest. Our tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth and it can guide us wherever we go because we're reacting with our tongues. We're saying things before we've actually thought about it. But if we invite God in the process, then we're willing to say, God, be here. And maybe it's not a formal invitation. Dearest Lord, would you join me in this venture? But God, I need you right now. As you're snapping your fingers or whatever. Better get here. And after we invite, we can ask, God, would you give me the awareness to know what I'm feeling right now? Is it, is it fear? Is it shame? Is it pride? God, would you give me the wisdom to control my tongue? Because a lot of times when we want to react, it's still wise to say something, but it's most wise to say the right thing when we're quick, slow, slow. So we ask God for wisdom, for guidance, for patience, for understanding of what we're really feeling. And then listen. One of my favorite speakers is named John A. Cuff, and he's written a few books on achieving your goals and understanding uh, how, how God might be working in your purpose if you just begin doing what you've been called to do. But as he coaches executives, as he coaches business leaders, church leaders, through conflict, he said your first response should always start with, you may be right. It's a really disarming phrase. When someone says something that you want to react to, after you stop, invite, ask, and listen, listening allows you to truly admit, like, you may be right based on your history, based on your interpretation, based on your perspective. You may be right. And when you say that, it tells the other person that you're willing to recognize that there's a chance. Maybe it's 0.001% chance. But may, you may be right but here's how I feel about it. Because it also disarms you. Because when you feel like you're right, but you're willing to tell someone else that they might be right, then you realize you might be wrong. And maybe it's like a a 0.001% chance that you're wrong, but that that much disarming that can happen can really bless the rest of your conversation. And when you're listening, you can hear. It's hard to listen when you're talking. It's harder to listen when you're yelling. I know. It's harder to listen when you're focusing on getting revenge or being right. And then the next step is to rethink. What do I really want out of this situation? What is the point of me commenting on this post? Like, what do I want to happen? Are they going to read that comment and think, I should vote that way 
That person is so right now that they've said that one thing on that one post I had. I should follow Jesus now that they post that semi-judgmental, condescending post on my picture. What do I really want to happen here? Because if you want something to happen, it probably needs to happen in love. When you rethink, you can break the cycle and become unstuck. When you rethink, you can stop blaming the wrong things and people. You can stop worrying and stop being afraid when you rethink all of that. And when you've started to rethink, it's always good to just keep thinking in that process. Thinking is so powerful. I need to get that tattooed like on my wrist. Thinking is powerful, Josh. And then the very last thing is to do or do not. Okay, you've, you've been through this process. You're probably ready to respond should you respond. Or should you bow out of the conversation? Should you set down the phone or close the computer or, or walk away for a minute, get your Snickers, get a water, whatever you need to do? Because you may need to respond still or you may need to just let this one go and call it a win in the response column. Because I think that anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And if anger is secondary to shame, pride, worry, doubt, fear, if we focus on the righteousness of God, we're more able to honor God and show others his love and grace. So I'm going to close this in prayer, and I want to give us a chance to respond to what God is doing. And the band's going to lead us in a song of worship, and I, I want us to spend this time thinking, what is God calling me to do? Where am I overreactive? Where am I under-responsive? And how can I better produce his righteousness by revealing that I know quick, slow, slow. Let's pray. God, you are good, and I thank you so much for not reacting to everything we do and not reacting to every time we sin, but responding to us in love, gently rebuking and correcting us, gently encouraging us and blessing us. So would you bless us with conviction of heart and awareness of how you're sharpening us to better look like your son? and to better produce the righteousness of God. And would we be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? And would people begin to wonder why we're that way, and would we be able to point them to you? So would you work in your boldness to give us the faith to follow you and submit to you and honor you? We thank you for your son, Jesus, and the grace you've given us through his death and resurrection. And it's in his great name we pray. Amen.